welcome to this talk by the Theosophical author and lecturer, Kurt Leland. Kurt's topic this evening is Theosophical Resilience and the Mind of a Master. Kurt is a national lecturer for the Theosophical Society in America, specializing in the works of Annie Besant and Charles W. Leadbeater. He has edited and annotated Leadbeater's classic text, The Chakras, as well as an anthology entitled Invisible Worlds, Annie Besant on Psychic and Spiritual Development. He has also written on subjects such as astral projection, near-death experiences, and the spiritual effects of composing, performing, and listening to music. His most recent book is entitled Rainbow Body, A History of the Western Chakra System, from Blavatsky to Brennan. Last year, the British Journal for the History of Philosophy published his essay, Friendly to All Beings, Annie Besant as Ethicist. He is currently working on a reader's guide to Leadbeater's writings. Kurt currently lives in the United States in Boston, Massachusetts. He is well known to many of us as not only a very deep student of the theosophical teachings, but also a very dear friend. Please join me in welcoming Kurt Leland to the platform for this international convention. Kurt? Thank you, Barbara. When I saw the theme of this year's convention, Living in the Now, Challenges of the Inner Life, I immediately thought of the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the spiritual well-being of those closest to me, my friends, family, and students. Among challenges to the inner life, such as famines, wars, earthquakes, the ravages of climate change, and repressive political regimes. This pandemic will likely be remembered by many of us as one of the most universal, deadly, and perhaps prolonged. For me, it has certainly been a lesson in resilience. For many years, I've been holding meditation classes. Each class has five or six students. We meet for two hours every other week, beginning with a check-in during which we share what has gone on in our lives since our previous meeting. Prior to the pandemic, we met in person in my living room. The pandemic put a stop to that. Like many such groups, including the Theosophical Society, we had to move online. Though the intended focus of my groups was self-exploration, as the pandemic wore on, I noticed that students were becoming increasingly less able to focus on our work. Their check-ins showed signs of apathy, impatience, frustration, stress, anxiety. They were often dejected or burnt out from working at home instead of an outside workplace, giving up in-person attendance of concerts, movies, and restaurants, and adopting new habits of self-care, such as wearing masks and social distancing. During our meetings, they had trouble taking in and remembering instructions. They weren't able to concentrate on the task at hand, though they often felt restored or uplifted when our time together came to a close. Such effects had worn off by our next meeting and they were once again dejected and burnt out. Gradually, the focus of the class shifted from self-exploration to survival. Like most of us living under pandemic conditions, my students were being worn down by constant threats to their physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well being. At the physical level, there was fear that any trip outside the home could lead to exposure to the COVID 19 virus with potentially devastating or deadly effects on the body. At the emotional level, there was grief over lost loved ones, family, and friends, as well as horrifying and tragic news 
about the pandemic's effects on other parts of the world. At the mental level, there was stress and confusion over the conflicting reports and instructions of scientists, health officials, politicians, news organizations, and social media, including misinformation and outright denials of the disease's existence. At the spiritual level, we were in danger of losing our sense that life has meaning and purpose, that there's some benevolent higher power watching over and guiding us, whether we call it soul or higher self, God or the universe. Gradually, it became clear that the best support I could give my struggling students was to focus on resilience. The dictionary definition of this word runs as follows. The ability to recover quickly from illness, change, or misfortune. Buoyancy. The property of a material that enables it to resume its former shape or position after being bent, stretched, or compressed. Elasticity. In this definition, the words buoyancy and elasticity are of special interest. Buoyancy points in the direction of joy. How might it be possible to endure the conditions of the pandemic or any personal, familial, regional, national, or international catastrophe in a state of joy? Elasticity suggests not only adaptability, but also flexibility. What if the material being bent, stretched, or compressed was consciousness itself? How quickly could we restore our flexibility of consciousness after deformation by stress or trauma to its former state of buoyancy or joy? These questions have guided me during the pandemic, not only in my personal life, but also in the work I've done with students. They've led me to identify a number of things that reduce our resilience, our flexibility of consciousness, and some methods of restoring resilience, of returning our consciousness to its former state of buoyancy or joy. For example, in March 2019, when the pandemic was declared, the first requirement for each of us was to move from ignorance to knowledgeability about what we were up against. We had to learn how COVID-19 was transmitted, what its symptoms were, and how deadly it could be. Meanwhile, the international scientific and medical communities were rushing to acquire and pass on this unknown but essential information. We had to learn what precautions to take and overcome personal resistance to the extraordinary measures of wearing masks and social distancing whenever we left our homes. Both in the news and among my family, friends and students, I noticed that those who willingly gathered and acted upon such information tended to be more resilient than those who resisted or rejected it. In a similar way, people who reacted to the pandemic by asking themselves what they could learn and how they could grow and thrive under such conditions tended to be more resilient than those who reacted with shock, overwhelm, or denial. On the internet, I've read numerous stories about people who have protested the changes demanded by public health and governmental bodies. Trying to maintain or return to a previous state of normalcy, such people were often seething with resentment over having to wear masks and social distance. Right or wrong in advocating the sovereignty of individual rights over government-mandated civic duties, their resentment seemed to reduce their resilience. Doing the opposite of what was required of them, they were often unable to protect themselves and their families from the hard lessons of contagion. I wondered whether a choice of equanimity over resentment could have helped them maintain their autonomy while making wiser, less damaging choices. Month by month, I came to understand that the greatest threat to our resilience cuts across the boundaries 
of differing political philosophies to affect us all. Let's call it despair versus endurance. During the pandemic, we've had to change our personal and social behavior so extremely and for such a long period of time that it's easy to fall into the belief that the pandemic will never end. Periodically, I've heard people say, I'm just done with this pandemic, but the pandemic isn't over yet. The endurance of such people has crashed and with it, their resilience. They're likely to make unsafe choices in an attempt to restore what they see as a pre-pandemic golden age of personal and social freedom. Throughout these troubled times, my exploration of the questions of what reduces resilience and what restores it has been guided by theosophical teachings, especially a passage written by our second international president, Annie Besant in 1896. In this passage, she attempts to describe the mind of one who has achieved a superhuman level of evolutionary development, a being that our literature calls a master of the wisdom. The consciousness of the master stretches itself out in any direction in which he sends it, assimilates itself with any point to which he directs it, knows anything which he wills to know, and all this in order that he may help perfectly, that there may be nothing that he cannot feel, nothing that he cannot foster, nothing that he cannot strengthen, nothing that he cannot aid in its evolution. To him, the whole world is one vast evolving whole, and his place in it is that of a helper of evolution. He is able to identify himself with any step, and at that step, to give the aid that is needed. Most of us are likely to think of the mind of a master as something achievable only after scores of lifetimes. Even though our literature is rife with books that outline the steps necessary to approach such a state, for example, any Besson's In the Outer Court and The Path of Discipleship, the magnitude of the endeavor seems overwhelming and the goal beyond our reach. But what if we thought about her description of the mind of the master as a definition of ideal resilience, an adaptability that allows us to know what to do next under any set of circumstances? In, in the outer court, Besant has spoken of the mind of the master in terms of boundless compassion, infinite strength, radiant joy, and uttermost peace. This combination of qualities, she says, is the ideal that one day we shall become. The method of achieving this ideal is self-sacrifice, also known as selfless service. For as Besant says, life is meant for service and not for self-seeking. Let's think of compassion, strength, joy, and peace as concomitants of ideal resilience. As we develop these qualities, we approach the mind of the master. But let's not seek such qualities for our own sake. During troubled times, such as the present pandemic, our task should be to develop and maintain our resilience for the sake of helping others do the same. Using the mind of the master as our ideal, let's explore this specifically theosophical brand of resilience. I believe it could best be described in the following phrase, joyful, compassionate equanimity in service. Joyful, compassionate equanimity in service. Our literature abounds in impressive, quotable maxims. These are often brought forward on our lecture platforms and in our journals, something in the manner of the glory that is us or hurrah theosophy. They tell us how the world should be 
and perhaps also how we should be in the world. But rarely have I seen them plumbed for the advice and consolation they could provide in troubled times as a means of promoting ideal resilience. Take, for example, the three truths from the Idyll of the White Lotus, an inspired novel by Mabel Collins. These are glorious, resounding statements of vitally important spiritual principles. They impress us with every hearing or reading, yet they're almost too resonant to be examined, and the power of the teachings they contain may not be fully grasped or tapped. Here's the first of these truths. The soul of man is immortal, and his future is a thing whose growth and splendor has no limit. Shouldn't we be asking ourselves, where's the growth during this pandemic, and where's the splendor? How tempted are we to bury our heads in the sand and wait till the crisis passes? Yet resilience requires that we consent to be in the body, on the planet, in the midst of a pandemic, or a war, or an unjust regime. Otherwise, our resilience falters, even with our heads in the sand. We have to show up and be fully present to ourselves and to others. During such times, if we happen to ask, where's the splendor? We'll probably answer, nowhere. Yet resilience requires that we see splendor somewhere or we lose faith in God, soul, humanity. I suggest that the growth experienced during troubled times develops from watching and participating in a sense of emerging brotherhood. And the splendor develops from our amazement over witnessing examples of what could be called achieved unity consciousness, even if brief or temporary. By this phrase, I mean such things as the local, national, and international outpouring of support for the victims of natural disasters, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, and floods, or the humanitarian aid provided by NGOs, non-governmental organizations, in regions devastated by war, pestilence, and famine. Certainly, during the pandemic, we've seen doctors and nurses lay down their lives. They've been first responders to the seriously ill in the midst of the unknown dangers posed by a deadly, newly discovered virus. We've also seen laboratories throughout the world devoting time, energy, and funding toward the study of this virus, attempting to discover means for caring for those infected and best practices for preventing infection. Of course, there has also been non-cooperation and obfuscation, especially by local and national governments seeking to suppress statistics concerning positive cases of COVID-19 and deaths from the disease. The news media have tended to focus on such failures, promoting resentment, anxiety, despair. To maintain resilience, we need to focus instead on the splendid sacrifice of those who have united in a mission to save individuals, cities, states, countries, and humanity itself from the ravages of COVID-19. That's what I mean by achieved unity consciousness. Let's go on to examine the second of the three truths. The principle which gives life wells in us and without us is undying and eternally beneficent, is not heard or seen or smelt, but is perceived by the man who desires perception. We call this principle by a variety of names, including God, soul, peace, and joy, but where or how do we find such things within and without us? I would suggest that we find them within us through turning inward by some means of peace-inspiring meditation. We find them without us by turning outward to contemplate and appreciate the divine beauty in nature and other beings. The secret of theosophical resilience is to stay in touch with this principle that gives life whether we call it God, soul, peace, or joy. Otherwise, 
we lose our endurance and are reduced to despair. Let's turn now to the last of the three truths. Each man is his own absolute lawgiver, the dispenser of glory or gloom to himself, the decreer of his life, his reward, his punishment. Clearly, this truth refers to what we call the law of karma, also known as the moral law of action and reaction, or of cause and effect. Perusing our ample literature on this subject, for example, Annie Besant's book entitled Karma, we quickly find a virtually unanimous response. Selfishness produces gloom and or karmic punishment. Unselfishness produces glory and or karmic reward. Naturally, a further question arises. How can we get through troubled times in glory or joy instead of gloom? For illumination here, let's turn to the key to theosophy by our revered co-founder, H.P. Blavatsky. In this textbook of theosophical ethics, HPB outlines several aims of theosophy. The first is the relief of human suffering under any or every form, moral as well as physical. She claims that moral suffering is the more important of the two. Another aim is to inculcate ethics and a third to purify the soul. I've often wondered whether suffering is the right word in such a context. The Buddha taught that all life is suffering. If so, then the theosophical task of relieving suffering would be daunting, if not overwhelming. Where do we begin? I know good-hearted people, both inside and outside the theosophical society, who are virtually paralyzed by the amount of suffering in the world and the question of what to do about it. That's not resilience. What would happen if we exchange the word suffering with need or needfulness? I think it would be true to say that the entire world exists in a state of needfulness. It also seems that once a genuine need has been satisfied, it vanishes from our awareness, though it will certainly be replaced by others. True needs, such as those for water, food, clothing, shelter, and maintenance of health are always specific, and suffering always results when they're not satisfied. Besides these physical needs, there are emotional needs, including comfort when we grieve, mental needs, including literacy and education, and spiritual needs, including belief in the existence and guidance of higher powers, such as the soul, God, or other angelic or divine beings. Wherever our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs may require money to be satisfied, there are also true financial needs and the suffering that results from financial insecurity. One way of relieving suffering without producing overwhelm in ourselves might be to determine the nature of another's need and attempt to provide what's needed, one need at a time. This is what Annie Besant means when she says that the master is able to identify himself with any step and at that step to give the aid that is needed. Let's return to HBB's claims about the aims of theosophy. What does she mean by the phrase inculcation of ethics? My understanding is that theosophical ethics involves what Annie Besant calls being friendly to all beings. For example, in her advanced textbook of Hindu religion and ethics, she advocates a system of establishing right relations with all beings physical and non-physical, from whatever we call God, the source of all being, through lesser gods or powers, such as angels or devas, to humans, animals, the plant world, and the substances that make up our physical environment, including air, fire, water, and earth. For Besson, 
right relations develop from ahimsa, a Sanskrit word often translated as non-harming. To be friendly to all beings, we must be kind in thought, word, and deed as an expression of non-harming. We must also be kind to ourselves, eschewing negative thoughts and self-judgment, as well as actions that would undermine our physical, emotional, and psychological health. Non-harming may also require a willingness to sacrifice ourselves in some way to promote the well-being and evolution of others. For example, by sharing time, energy, and financial resources in ways that promote others' growth. But let's not rescue others by martyring ourselves. That's not resilience. Unless we're called by exceptional circumstances to lay down our lives, it's enough to show people how to restore their own resilience. Again, the mind of the master sets the bar. We evolve by becoming helpers of evolution and not by destroying ourselves as potential future sources of help. If the world is indeed one vast evolving whole, it includes everyone, even us. Through the practice of non-harming, we study this evolving world, gradually discovering our special place within and contribution to that evolution. If we're able to make this service-based contribution in joy, compassion, and equanimity, people might ask us not only what we're doing, but also why and how we do it. Explaining the nature of theosophical resilience to such inquirers would fulfill HPB's aim of inculcation of ethics. What does HPB mean by the phrase purification of the soul? The simplest answer to this question is progressive removal of what she elsewhere calls the great heresy, the separateness of soul or self from the one universal infinite self. Annie Besant explains this process in terms of developing an ever more expansive set of ethics. Thus we rise through what she calls family, social, national, and international morality. Eventually, we achieve interworld morality, which includes our relations not only with people who have died, in particular, our own ancestors, but also with the minerals, plants, animals, nature spirits, angels, devas, and gods of this world and its associated non-physical planes. Thus, the inculcation of ethics within us is a means of purification of soul. We set our aim on unity consciousness, the recognition of oneself in all beings. Gradually, we, re we remove everything that stands in the way of embodying this state of unity. As Besson puts it, we shall see as we study morality that all its precepts are founded on this unity of the self. Further illumination on the question of getting through the present pandemic or some other catastrophe and glory versus gloom comes from the well-known three objects of the Theosophical Society. They were cited at the beginning of our lodge and study group meetings and printed prominently in our journals, but we may not have realized what they could teach us about ideal resilience. The first object is to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. Consider all the suffering that has been caused by non-inclusiveness along these lines, as well as others, such as sexual orientation and gender identity. Any effort we make to create a warm and welcoming nucleus of universal brotherhood could fulfill one of HPB's aims of theosophy, relief of human suffering, physical and moral. Let's take on the challenge of becoming friendly to all beings in thought, feeling, word and action by practicing non-harming and inclusivity in every way. This is one path to achieving the ideal resilience represented by the mind of the master. 
To paraphrase Besson, such a task teaches us how to help perfectly. So there may be nothing we cannot feel, nothing we cannot foster, nothing we cannot strengthen, nothing we cannot aid in its evolution. Our second object, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science, comes under the heading of inculcation of ethics. We study such literature, including theosophical literature, to learn about and develop right relations with God or the gods, masters and angels, humanity, and the other physical and non-physical kingdoms inhabiting our planet. Equally important is passing on the results of our studies to others, not perhaps by buttonholing them, but by recommending books that have been helpful in clarifying our ethics and answering questions about right thought, feeling, or action under a variety of inwardly and outwardly challenging circumstances. <clears throat> in this way, we might support them in discovering or returning to the buoyancy and adaptability required by troubled times, thus passing on to them our own resilience. On social media and elsewhere on the internet, I've seen accusations by some theosophical groups that our members indulge in too much study and don't focus enough on practical service. The same accusation comes up in the key to theosophy. Let's see how HPB addresses it. Inquirer. But all this literature, to the spread of which you attach so much importance, does not seem to me of much practical use in helping mankind. This is not practical charity. Theosophist. We think otherwise. We hold that a good book, which gives people food for thought, which strengthens and clears their minds, and enables them to grasp truths which they have dimly felt but could not formulate. We hold that such a book does a real substantial good. Of course, we must know which books are good and the ways in which they're good. We can only gain that knowledge by extensive reading in our literature while engaging in comparative study of how contemporary science, religion, and philosophy are dealing with age-old personal, social, and spiritual problems. Nor should we neglect spiritual and philosophical classics, such as the Bhagavad Gita or the Bible, which are full of good counsel and consolation during troubled times and can thus promote our own and others' resilience. Sadly, our third object, to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in humanity, is often neglected because of a basic misunderstanding of its meaning and application. Such investigation is frequently derided as the pursuit of psychic powers or the practice of magic, which are deemed useless in the promotion of universal brotherhood. My view is that our third object is intended to promote the purification of soul to the point that we're able to achieve compassionate joy or joyful compassion. This is the bliss of unity consciousness, of seeing the oneself in all things and all things in oneself. It's achieved through stripping away all the selfishness that obscures this sense of oneness both through meditation and selfless service. Thus we rise through expanding levels of morality, from concern for our family's well-being to that for all creatures, physical and non-physical. All laws of nature and all latent powers in humanity have their origin and explanation in the one self. The investigation of the one self in all is the true goal of our third object. When that's our aim, we can't help but experience bleed-throughs of any Besant's interworld morality, such as perceiving and communicating with deceased persons or non-physical beings. We're safe if we do so while developing the compassionate joy of unity consciousness, also called booty or spiritual intuition. The compassionate joy of Bodhi 
is not only the greatest power latent in humanity, but also a key to theosophical resilience. It's what makes relief of human suffering possible. Without it, we're overwhelmed and even paralyzed by the suffering we see in the world, all the more so when we include the suffering of animals and the environment. Let's consider now how self-sacrifice relates to ideal resilience. Throughout her theosophical career, Annie Besant spoke of the polarity of life and form. Life is consciousness, spiritual. Form is matter, material. Life takes on and expresses itself through form. Thus, we have something that could be called a soul, life, expressing itself through a body, form. Forms, Besant teaches, are meant to be broken. Do not let the form constrain the life, she says. We should let the life grow. Furthermore, if the form is still useful, the life will make it more helpful. If your inner life has outgrown its forms, the inner life will reform it. This, of course, is the adaptability required of us during troubled times. Besson continues, if you have thoroughly outgrown it, the form, the inner life, will break it. What Besson doesn't say here is that when forms are broken, the consciousness within them is liberated into a larger life and form. One example, of course, is the after-death life experienced in the paradisal realm we theosophists call Devachan. During any catastrophe, such as the present pandemic, forms are broken. I don't mean merely that people lose their lives in their present physical body. The form of daily life may also be broken, as when a flood or earthquake interrupts delivery of essential needs, such as food, water, fuel, or electricity, or destroys a house or village. Social forms, too, may be broken, as in the case of travel restrictions, lockdowns, and social distancing, things we've had to endure during this pandemic. What I've seen in my meditation students is that their resilience or lack of it depends on how quickly they're able to let go of broken forms. If they cling to these forms, their resilience is lowered. If they let go of such clinging, it rebounds. What happens when they let go of clinging? First, they're consenting to the new conditions of their growth. Second, liberation from old forms and from clinging to them opens up new possibilities of thought, feeling, and action, even if, in the beginning, they're primarily focused on survival. Before long, they may discover how to thrive under these new conditions. One aspect of this thriving develops from helping others adapt to the emerging new normal. Compassion arises from seeing how others are challenged by such changes, by seeing how their resilience suffers from clinging to broken forms. How might it be possible to reach them, turning their present state of shock and paralysis into flow? Finding an appropriate next step may contribute to relief and joy on both sides, even in the midst of grieving over what was lost. Our task is to teach resilience by our own example. We can do this best by sacrificing our tendency to cling to broken forms and the joy that results from liberating ourselves into a larger life. We look for a step that someone who's less resilient may take to overcome their clinging. This is the smaller self sacrificed on the altar of the larger self for the sake of humanity. This, I believe, is the gift we're offered whenever we experience a personal, regional, national, or international tragedy or catastrophe. Not only do we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others, we're also liberated into a larger life we get closer to source. Our joy, our capacity to serve others with resilience, each continually increases. 
we're approaching the mind of the master. And if in the midst of personal and worldwide devastation and loss of life, we remind ourselves again and again that forms are broken to liberate consciousness into a larger life, even as we grieve, we may avoid the danger of losing our endurance to despair. In closing, I would like to recommend some guidelines for achieving the ideal of theosophical resilience I've put before you, joyful, compassionate equanimity in service. First, let's keep Annie Besant's description of the consciousness of the master constantly before us. Thus, there should be nothing we cannot feel on behalf of humanity. However, we'll not only need compassion, but also equanimity in order not to be overwhelmed by human suffering. Let's also remember the challenge posed by the third great truth of Mabel Collins, how to live from glory instead of gloom in the midst of troubled times. Let's be attentive to the glory of what it means to be human. Unexpected moments of achieved unity consciousness played out on a local, regional, national, or international stage. Let there be nothing we cannot foster, strengthen, or aid in its evolution. This task, of course, will be a perpetual work in progress. My personal formula for undertaking such a task is fourfold. First, show up in compassion. Second, be fully present in equanimity. Third, be kind to yourself and others in service. Fourth, find a step to take or a need to fulfill in joy. Often, that step is as simple as letting people know they're seen, heard, understood, and valued. Something they say may be the right next step for them in resolving their problems. Our task is to listen for it and highlight it when, when it comes. In this way, we approach the mind of the master as a helper of evolution. Meanwhile, we're constantly working to achieve the joy of unity consciousness in ourselves by seeing the entire world as one vast evolving whole. Without that joy, we won't have the strength and endurance to get through a prolonged crisis, such as the present pandemic. Finally, by means of selfless service, we learn how to identify the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and financial needs that cause suffering in others and discover the step that allows us to give the aid that's needed. Thus do we live in the now while sacrificing all clinging to the past. Thus do we navigate the challenges to our inner life posed by this now and whatever new normal arises from it. Thus do we implement the ideal of theosophical resilience that I call joyful, compassionate equanimity and service. Thank you for your attention and thank you to the organizing committee of this day's talks for the opportunity to speak on the subject of living in the now, challenges of the inner Thank you so much. You have given us all a great deal to ponder over the coming days, weeks, and months about how we are living in this difficult time. Thank you so much, Kurt. And thanks to all of you for being a part of this program.